Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10. And I thought it was, uh, it would, it's quite fitting the way it's all fallen really with everything that's been going on this weekend but also with Mother's Day uh, being today and just kind of thinking about uh, our theme for this morning really. Um, it is a theme uh, in some ways that has um, uh, Mark, Mark 10, 13, Mark 10, uh, verse 13. It is a theme in some ways that has a, a real application to parents and I'm conscious that uh, not all of us in here this morning are parents or grandparents but uh, there's also uh, much that we, can gl- that we can just glean from this passage in general concerning the, uh, the character of Christ and, and uh, just uh, we, you know, the various uh, different individuals that are involved uh, here in this short section of scripture. So it's Mark chapter 10 verse 13 to 16, Jesus blesses the little children. Starting at verse 13. Then they brought little children to him, that's Jesus, that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And Jesus took them up in his his arms, he laid his hands on them and he blessed them. Let's just pray, shall we? Father, we, we do thank you uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, reality, this picture that we see here of Christ, the, the one who was willing to come and to receive these little children uh, unto himself. Uh, speaking of um, this childlike faith, Lord, and, and I just pray, Father, that you would um, that you'd just give us that uh, childlike faith ourselves today, Lord, that we would just see the simplicity that is found in Christ and in all you have us to do and all, you, all that you are, Lord. And I pray that you'd help me, Lord. Give me clarity of, of thought and speech today, uh, unction, Lord. And uh, I just pray that you'd help us and help me to be faithful in uh, sharing this word. We pray for the glory of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> amen. So, in our pa- I've really broken it down, the passage this morning, into four four different sections uh, with four different individuals that are being kind of spoken of and uh, dealt with really in this passage. The first one being um, the faithfulness of the bringers, if I could put it like that, the faithfulness of the bringers, the sinfulness of the rejectors, the sinfulness of rejectors, the willing uh, uh, willing kindness of the saviour, and then fourthly, uh, a childlike faith to be received. I've just uh, put that fourth point in there, a childlike faith to be received. So really, Let's begin, let's look at this text, the the first uh, section that we have uh, this morning, the first point, the faithfulness of the bringers, the faithfulness of the bringers. Um, Verse 13 tells us, then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. The adults, to uh, to some degree, they, who are the they in this? Most most probably the parents, maybe the the legal guardians of of these youngsters. We have a picture here of, uh, of grown-ups to some, to some degree of adults, maybe in some ways uh, older uh, uh, children or younger adults, bringing children to Christ. They brought him to them. And what did they want? What did they want? Well, they, they wanted that he would touch them. It says that he, that he may, may touch them. Now, during Jesus' ministry, uh, we often see pictures of Christ doing works amongst the people. Uh, many individuals coming around him. We know uh, the healing of the paralytic, for those who can remember that far back, right back in Mark chapter 2. There was a crowd that filled the house. Um, for those of you who can remember the woman with the issue of blood who touched the, the garments, the, the, the robe of Christ, the, the clothing of Christ. And he said, who touched my, my clothing? And the disciples replied, there's a multitude thronging about you. There was often uh, different groups of people uh, that were mixing and mingling with Christ. We think of Zacchaeus. The crowd was so great. He was a man of short stature. So he, cr- he climbs the sycamore tree um, to, in order to see him. So Christ was, he wasn't um, 
I've used this uh, picture before, but often when you see dignitaries or you see celebrities or famous people come into a town, there will be, um, you know, they'll put a fence up or a barrier, they have a red carpet and they keep everybody at arm's length. And that wasn't what we see here with Jesus. He was one who mixed with the people. He was one who often was up close and personal, so to speak. And there was times when we see him just touching people, I guess in that general sense, but there was times when the touching of the, that Christ would would uh, perform on people when he would actually lay his hands on them was seemingly significant in some way with regards to the restoration, the healing uh, of the people. There was um, a deaf man with a speech impediment in Mark 7 uh, and, and the, in, that, in that particular example again the crowd begged Jesus, it says that they begged Jesus to put his hands on him. They begged him to put his hands on him so there must have been something in that, uh, in, in, in Jesus doing that throughout his ministry from time to time. We see that he put his fingers in his ears and he spat and he touched his tongue, I doubt, with that in that message back then. And again, the blind man in Bethsaida in Mark 8, Jesus spat on his eyes and put his, put his hands on him, asked him if he saw anything. And you know, you know the account when he said, that, oh, I see people, they're like trees. And then he, he prayed with him again, put his hands on his eyes again, and then he, he saw clearly. Um, <clears throat> in Mark 6, just, uh, just one more, I guess, for the sake of time really, but in Mark 6, um, we see that it says that Jesus, wherever he entered into villages, uh, cities, or the country, and they laid the sick before him in the marketplaces, and they begged him that he might just touch the, the, the sorry, that, that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And then it says in Mark chapter 6, verse 56, it says, and as many as, as those who touched him were made well. There was a, a significance in Jesus laying his hands on people not necessarily in every uh, particular miracle not in every deliverance we know there, there were times where he just spoke a word and people were healed people were delivered but we do see a significance in the, the touching of Christ towards people um, <clears throat> in Matthew's account of the same uh, 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 reading that we've just read today concerning the little children Matthew 19 it says the little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. So we know there was a connection between him laying his hands on them and praying for these children. And we know from our account today that in some way he, they may receive a blessing uh, from Christ. It says at the very end of our, our passage today, verse 16, that he laid his hands on them and he blessed them. Now, what was the motivation of the parents. We spoke about them, what they wanted him to do. They wanted him to lay his hands on them. They wanted a blessing from Christ. What was their, their, their motivation? <clears throat> well, we see we see that they wanted him to bless their children. They want that, it was very simple in many ways. Here are these little ones, these infants, these, these uh, maybe toddlers, maybe babies of sorts. We don't know exactly the age groups. We know that there was a point where Jesus took them up in his arms. They would have been uh, youngsters. And they wanted a blessing from him. Now you sometimes see this in a very, if I could put it in a, um, in a negative sense in some ways. You see uh, sometimes within the, uh, the Catholic religion, the Pope will come and people will lift their children. They'll be taking their children just to get a touch from this man. This, uh, in many ways, a, a sinful man that has no power and, and no, um, no authority in that sense. But here with Christ, we see something very different. We see Christ, the Son of God, he was more than able to bless these little ones and to pray for them, to commit them to his, to his father, to give them uh, this blessing towards them. And the, and the parents who, who brought them, the guardians, these adults, it would have taken some effort on their behalf. It would have taken effort for them to get their children uh, towards to, to, to Christ. Um, we get, uh, as I mentioned, we get the impression here that they were infants as Christ took them up in his arms. There would have been something of an, uh, an assertion that was needed, an intentionality, uh, a willingness maybe to be rejected uh, and opposed to, which interestingly from our text today, we see that, that kind of happened at one, uh, towards one point. They had to have a, a willingness to step out and to, to seek the Lord in the midst of all the people, to bring their children before him. 
So what we see here from this picture, we see these adults bringing their children, and it really just shows us and gives us a wonderful picture of, uh, uh, of parents, of grown-ups, bringing children before the Lord, bringing children before the Lord. Now, as I've mentioned, I'm conscious that some of us in here today may not have our own children as such, but, you know, um, the, there are people that in, within our families, there are youngsters, uh, even within the church here, that we can bring before the Lord, we can bring before him. So how do we bring our children before the Lord t uh, today? We, obviously, we don't live in kind of the first century uh, Galilean area. Jesus isn't walking around in the same way that he was back then. But we can bring our children, our grandchildren, the, the youngsters that we know within our families, the youngsters that we know within the church, we can bring them before the Lord. Firstly, in prayer, in prayer. Praying for our children bringing them to the Lord in prayer, so to speak, not in this physical way, in, in the same way that these individuals did in our text today, but bringing them to the Lord in prayer. Praying for their salvation, praying for their sanctification. Just a few points here, really, if I may. I've got some kind of practical application with regards to prayer and the word that we can go through. Firstly, to pray not only for our children, but, or our grandchildren, but to pray with them, to pray with them. There's times where we, can, where we can come and we can gather together. It's good to have those times as families where we come and we uh, encourage them to pray together with us as individuals, as and where we can do that. Another thing is to share answers of prayer. If you've been praying with your children and, 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 uh, and uh, there's been answers to prayer, just to share those answers with them, to show them that God answers prayer, that he's, that he's the powerful God who, who hears the prayers of his people. Uh, you, you often see this within people in ministry, um, and it can apply for each one of us who are the, who, who are the, the church of Christ when the Lord answers our prayers. You see ministers, and, and often when they're on the front line, doing front line ministry, the Lord comes through and, and answers prayer so evidently. And it's good to share those realities with our children. You know, did you see what God did there? We needed this, we needed this, and we sought him in prayer, and he answered the prayer. And that, would really, that can really bolster the faith of our children. It can really encourage them, really inspire them, so to speak. So not only to pray for them, not only to pray with them, but to cultivate a habit of prayer, both together with them and independently. So it's something that they see us doing as parents, as grandparents, as, as uh, adults. They see us uh, cultivating a habit of prayer and they in turn would uh, develop a habit of prayer in their own walk uh, with the Lord as they grow. J.C. Ryle, the, uh, the Bishop of Liverpool, he writes these words. He says, parents, if you love your children, do all, do all that lies in your power to train them up in the habit of prayer. Show them how to begin. Tell them what to say. Encourage them to persevere. Remind them if they become careless and slack about it. Let it not be your fault at any rate if they never call on the name of the Lord. So if a child becomes careless and slack about prayer, let it not be because of us. Let it not be because of us as parents, as, as adults around those children. Encouraging the children to, to recognize thanksgiving in their prayers. It's not just a, a let's just have a 10 minutes now where we just come to God with a list of things that we want him to do for us. But let us be thankful. Let us come to prayer and, and adore the God who gives us our, our next breath. So we see this picture here of bringing children to the Lord and how we can, as Christians, we can bring our own children, our grandchildren to the Lord in prayer. You know, you often hear about people, uh, if you, you may have heard the expression about being preached into the kingdom. We're going to preach, people and, uh, preach to people the gospel until they get saved. But have you ever, I heard a pastor once talking about, have you ever considered about praying people into the kingdom of God? Maybe write a list of young people and just continue to pray until either they die or until God saves them. Now here's our children. There's you know, no, no closer... Uh, a soul that God has really uh, given us to, to, um, to, to, to have stewardship over and to have the, the, the privilege of, 
of looking after and caring and tending to their needs, but to, to be praying for them, to be committing them to the Lord until they, until they are won through to him. Let's remain consistent and persistent in our prayers. Secondly, not only do we bring our children to the Lord in prayer, but we bring, in a sense, the Lord to our children. I know that perhaps in some ways the Lord came to the location he was in in our text today and, and these families brought their children to him, but the Lord was there. The Lord was there. And we have an obligation as parents, as adults, uh, as grandparents, to be teaching the word uh, to our children. This is one of the reasons we uh, you know, look at this established Sunday school and we encourage family integrated worship. We want to see the children uh, sitting under the word of God. I would, uh, I would wholeheartedly encourage family devotions. If you have the, uh, it, well, it, not, not necessarily if we have the time, we, it's important that we try and make the time uh, for devotions with our families, with our children, uh, points throughout the week. Uh, as much as we can to uh, have times of family worship uh, together uh, as we come to the Lord, as we open the word of God before our children. And I've just got some practical points here. I'm conscious that this isn't a one-size-fits-all situation. Um, and we, we may have different uh, varying um, per perspectives concerning conscience and how we do family devotions and do we do it like this, do we do it like that. So I don't want to be too rigid with this, but also I just want us to be thinking biblically about how we, how we can uh, bring our, our children to the, lo the Lord and how we can bring the word to our children. It's not a one-size-fits-all situation with any of this stuff by, by any means. Children are of different ages, different abilities, different levels of understanding, but really, let's just start off from, from the scratch, really, just to, just to open the Bible up and just to read it together. Just be, in, just be regularly having Bibles, even Bibles around the house. Let's get one on the shelf in one room, one on the shelf in another room, just so the children can be used to knowing that this is the authority in our house. It's what does God say to us. Just opening it up having times of reading together, even if it's just reading, you go a few, uh, like a half a chapter at a time or a chapter at a time, depending on uh, the degrees uh, of where the children are at with, with those things. Getting them used to knowing where they can find certain passages. Where's the New Testament? Where's the Old Testament? Where can I read about King David? Where do I, where do I read about Jesus' ministry? Different areas of the Bible, just so they're used to opening, opening it up going through expounding on some of those passages family devotions doesn't it doesn't need to be an hour-long sermon um, <laughs> I heard a pastor would say that someone came to him and said I don't know what's happening I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to teach my children and they just seem to be switching off and the pastor said how long how long do you teach them for and he says oh we go for about an hour and the pastor said he said brother I'd be switching off if you were preaching at me for an hour so you know, it's, it's just, maybe it's uh, 10, 15 minutes, whatever, again, it just, whatever, you'll, you'll feel a, a convenient point when it seems to uh, reach that point. And each family is different, each, ch each child is different. One of the purposes of, of family integrated worship and the sermon on a Sunday is so that this can be, this can be taken, whatever's preached from the pulpit here, can be taken home and chewed over amongst the families and, and uh, questions can be asked and maybe it could be used as a springboard for devotions into the week ahead. I once knew a pastor that he would preach in the morning, then on a Sunday lunch he would have his kids and he would ask them questions about his sermon and they'd kind of have a bit of fun out of it and make a bit of fun, but it encouraged, it encouraged them to listen during the meeting, but also just really brought it, brought it to life throughout the rest of the week for them as a family. <clears throat> Focusing on the different stories of the scripture, uh, the, the stories where there's a, um, quite an impact, like the, intre you know, the David and Goliath stories, the, 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 the Jonah and the whale, the, the Noah's Ark, the stories that can really, really kind of captivate the, the um, pictorially, the, visually, the imagination of the children. You know, an exposition through Le Leviticus for you know, several months might not necessarily be the best place to start. And I'm not saying there's never a place for that. Um, but just these, you know, bringing the, the stories of the scriptures uh, to, the, to the children. Speaking to them. 
uh, <coughs> I've, I've mentioned about the, the key people of Scripture, but really just saturating the Word uh, as we bring it, the, the teaching, saturating it in, in the Gospel, a Gospel-saturated devotion each time, each day, leading them back to Christ, leading them to Christ, the work of the cross, who Jesus is, what he's done for them on that cross, speaking of things uh, such as the, the character of God, the nature of man, dealing with tough situations, uh, 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 tough topics such as sin and rebellion, so to speak. And there's some practical things. I, I've heard of one guy who, when he teaches his children, um, <clears throat> as a father, he, doesn't, he purposefully doesn't sit opposite and teach them kind of opposite them, but he'll get them and he'll sit them next to him. So they all learn together as a family. It's not sort of, you know, so the dynamic of the teaching isn't this is what I know and this is what you guys need to know. The dynamic of the teaching is what is the Lord uh, teaching us as a family today? And he actually physically gets them sitting next to him in order to bring that over to them. There's lots of human resources out there as well that we could make use of. Um, not an extensive list by any means, but there's, there's various things. Uh, trailblazers books and torchlighters videos. You can you, mix it up between books and visuals. And Then there's the catechisms, a very useful Westminster shorter catechism, catechisms for children. It's just important to remember that uh, there is a difference between the words of men and the words of God. And ultimately we want to be teaching the word of God. It's good to catechize our children. I'm a strong advocate of doing those things. But just remember that those are ultimately words of men as opposed to the words of God. The, making use of simple questions. What does the gospel mean? Uh, why is it good news? What, do, what is the bad news? How, did we, how do, did we inherit sin? What does that mean for our relationship with God? Did God leave us this way? What did he do? Uh, who did he send to fix it? And so on and so forth. Just basic questions. Teaching our children uh, the word of God. Making use out of everyday situations. There's a sunset. We see a sunset in distance. Creation, nature. You're walking through a field and you, you see a, 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 a field that's, as we were just look, reading of this morning, full of birds and arrayed the lilies arrayed in the field and using these uh, pictorial examples that we see around us just to, just to keep bringing the, the children's mind back to the word of God. What does God say about that? What does God say in these things? Also opportunities perhaps um, when things go on in the family there's an argument that's happened one of the brothers has hit the other brother or so on using these as an opportunity for how do we deal with these situations biblically what does the bible say about forgiveness what does the bible say about treating people kindly and so on so it's just bringing these situations uh, and taking our thoughts captive to the word of god amongst us within the family uh, last week we discussed about the, the shema in uh, deuteronomy 6 hear o israel the lord our God, the Lord is one. Speaking of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Um, and then it says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. There shall be frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. There should be a diligence about teaching our children, teaching our youngsters the word of God. Everyday situations within life, within the home. Proverbs 22 verse 6, a well-known verse. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. Ephesians 6 4. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. There's much in the Proverbs about the training of children, the early parts of Proverbs, uh, chapter 4, speaking of uh, hear my children in the instruction of a father and give attention to no understanding and how children are not to forsake uh, God's law and, and how they gain wisdom. I, I heard a, a really useful quote recently. Uh, Parents, your, your kids won't remember every meal that you feed them, yet each is instrumental in their physical growth. Likewise, they won't remember every passage of scripture that you teach them, but each is vital for their spiritual growth. You know, you can give your child a meal 
every, well, we do give our, child, our children meals every day. They're not going to remember every meal they've ever had, but it's vital for their growth. It's the same with the Word of God. They're not going to remember every scripture that they've been taught, but it will be vital for their growth. So why do we do this? Why do we teach our children these things? Why do we want to bring our children before the Lord in prayer? I know this is, in many ways, it sounds glaringly obvious. Why do we want to bring the Word of God to our children? <clears throat> Firstly, because God is worthy and He's revealed Himself to us in His Word and we should take the time to, to read that and to know who He is and to know Him through His Word so that He would be glorified in our lives and the advancement of His kingdom uh, would be established in, the, in our families, in our homes, amongst our children, to see our children's salvation. 2 Timothy 3.15, the Apostle Paul speaks to Timothy, he says, From childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which were able to make you wise, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you see, that's the aim here. The aim of teaching our children the Word of God and, pray and, and, and taking them to the Lord in prayer is to see them saved. It's not just to create young people who can recite memory verses. It's to see those verses work in their hearts and to see them one to God. I heard a pastor say once, um, you know, I think he was talking about his daughter being in a cinema at the age of 16 and there was a film that was on and, and she knew it was wrong to be there. She, she, uh, she was with her friends and she didn't want to be there. I think she ended up walking out. Um, but the point is that when, that when our children are, are ready to reach, they're, they're approaching adult life, we need to be training them and, and aiming to train them in such a way that, that they would reach that point when sin comes knocking at the door and they would be of the impression, I don't, not that I don't want to do this because mommy and daddy will think it's wrong, but I don't want to do this because I have a love for Jesus and he paid the price for that at the cross. That they would be saturated in, in a love for Christ and that is our aim. It's uh, the aim of family devotions, the aim of tr training our children in the ways they should go is so that they have a love for Christ, that they would in turn uh, be saved by him. That they, uh, often, often you see this, you see this with Christian families, they have youngsters and they're brought up in, in the ways of truth but they go off into the world and they reach adult life and they, they, they fly the nest, so to speak, and they go headlong into the world. They've not truly been converted. They know a lot of theology. They know a lot of spiritual things and, and religious form, but they haven't got that relationship with Christ at that point. And it's also important for us to recognize that teaching our children doesn't necessarily guarantee conversion. It's certainly going to be a big help. It's certainly going to take our children further up the mountain than perhaps where we were taken when we were younger. But it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be saved. You know, the Proverbs 26 verse, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's older he will not depart from it. It doesn't say when he's older he's going to get born again. You know, at the new birth, the work of salvation, is a, is a sovereign work of God in the hearts of his people. But let's give our children a, a fighting chance, so to speak. The children of the church here, the children in our families, our grandchildren. Let's give them that, that start with regards to the word of God and coming to Christ that is needed. <clears throat> so we've spoken about salvation. But the kingdom of God advanced in this generation. It's important to bring our children before the Lord, to see them saved but to see that the kingdom advance, yes, through their salvation, but these are the next generation of Christians. Once we've passed through, as our parents were one generation and their parents were a generation, once we've passed through, this is the next generation. And they, in turn, will then teach their children, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> our children are in need of a biblical worldview. There's nothing better than you can, than you can give your, and establish and encourage to be established within your child's life than, than that of a biblical worldview. It's the only way that a child really approaching into adult life can survive in, in the current culture of this world. 
the call of the parent. Now, I am conscious we've spoken a lot about parenting, and the, the, the sermon will shift in, in just a moment for sure, but the call of parenting, the parents of children have been given stewardship over this, these precious eternal souls as soon as that child is conceived there's an eternal soul that we have the precious joy and, and privilege of of stewarding and helping along the way in their journey we only have that short that opportunity for a, a short time at a young age yes we can give wise counsel even to adult children but there's, there's something about their younger years where that we can we can really pour into their hearts and I want to speak for a moment about it's Mother's Day, the calling of motherhood. And I, feel, I honestly feel that being a mother, a biblical mother, is probably one of, if not the highest callings that is given to any human being on the face of planet Earth. It's, it's a great privilege to be a, a, an evangelist and a pastor and a youth worker and all these things. But being a mother, often it's a very thankless task it's a hidden calling it's a grueling calling but it's a very important calling it's one that, where a lot of impact uh, can be given for the kingdom of god you may have heard of the wesley brothers Char um, charles and john wesley their mother susanna wesley um, i think she had 19 children nine of which died in died in infancy but john and charles were two of ten and they used to she would educate them in the younger years at home and uh, if you read through the biography and some of the things that went on it's amazing really that she would really install a sense of godliness and piety they were learning through the um, bible i heard once at the age of five look at starting in greek in genesis and all these things um, and she she would often she would often spend time she would sit with her apron and it was said that if you were to pass her window, you would sometimes see her. She would sit with her apron over the top of her head, and you can picture it, ten kids running around, and she would be there with her apron over her head, praying and re reading the Word and praying, having that time alone with God, that time which in turn then fueled her ministry as a mother to these children, two of which shook, shook Western culture under the power of God, shook Western culture as we, as we know it, John Wesley, obviously the found, one of the founders of the Methodist movement and uh, very instrumental in the Great Awakening of the 18th, uh, the 18th century. So being a mother, don't underestimate the gift of motherhood and, and, and the, 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 um, the calling of that ministry. Uh, and for those of us in here that are mothers uh, uh, this, this morning. I just want to talk a little bit, I guess, whilst I can about schools. Schools, the reason I bring that up, you, we have children and we live in a day and age where we have schools. Uh, many schools were started by Christians, um, Christian schools. The, the school system really was a, a Christian idea, uh, as far as I'm aware. Historically, the Christians were massively involved with the, the starting of many, many schools. Uh, but sad to say, here we are in the 21st century, and many schools have been almost um, hijacked in a way, if I could put it like that, by secularized philosophies, ungodly systems of thought, uh, worldly uh, perspectives. Um, obviously, some of you may know we, we homeschool ourselves. Uh, the Bible doesn't say, it doesn't say thou shalt homeschool. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't say that at all. Uh, what it does give is it gives the parents res the responsibility, the onus of being, the responsibility being on the parent for the upbringing of the children, including their education. Not the teachers of the schools, not the pastors of churches, not Sunday school teachers, not the children's peers, but the parents of the children. The parents of the children. Now, every, every child is different. Um, <coughs> I, I do believe that there, there are some schools today where you could even say is it potentially sinful to be sending a child into that environment but that's not with every school that's not with every school there's probably some public schools out there that have that are, that would be um, that would be sufficient there's some private schools that would be sufficient some home schools private tuition whatever that would look like again this is something that each family each parent stands or falls before the Lord concerning what they do with their children's education. It's, you think about it, it's a time where they go five days a week, um, you know, 30 hours a week, 
40 weeks of the year, year after year, they're in a certain environment. And that's something for us to consider how that looks for us, how we navigate through that uh, as Christian parents. Children aren't, uh, and I, maybe I'm sticking my head on the line here in saying this, but children, I don't believe children are, they're not, they're not mini missionaries. Some people say, well, the child can go into the, a, a sinful environment and have a positive impact. Um, <clears throat> but a child isn't, a child isn't a, a mini missionary, especially in an unconverted condition. We see the children, not just in the school systems, but just in general, surrounded by sinful ideologies, things that come through the TVs, uh, through, through the screens, and so, so on and so forth. Um, and we as Christian parents need to teach the children how to navigate uh, through some of these matters. We need to take them hand in hand, keep them looking unto Jesus. How do we navigate through issues such as evolution, uh, attacks on God's creative order concerning uh, his image bearers, the identity of, of man and all that's going on uh, uh, on that front at the moment. And you know, as much as, as good as Sunday school is, and as much of a blessing Sunday school is, uh, really the, the work for that is from the parents within the homes to be coming alongside the children, walking with them hand in hand. You know, we can't, I heard a, a guy say once, and I think I agree, you know, we can't expect um, our, our children, if they're in, in 30 hours a week in, in an environment where they're going to be taught certain things that are, gravitate against the Word of God, to then just come and have like 20 minutes colouring in a picture or or being you know, taught um, just kind of a verse here and there, that's not going to cut it. They need to be saturated in the Word of God and they need to be guarded and walked hand in hand. Please, please don't mishear me. I'm not saying that every school, uh, people who have their children in the school here, I'm not saying that that's a sinful thing to do that. All I'm saying is we need to just be thinking biblically about how that looks for each child. There are some uh, situations where maybe even homeschooling would be the wrong thing to do with a family. With, so it's just a case of knowing between you and the Lord, knowing where you sit on that and, um, and following your conscience. Whatever is not of faith it is sin and we need to be faithful to the call in our lives. Just another quick point on this with regards to children then we're going to move to another point. Um, sinful company, sinful company, peers. The, the Bible teaches that we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. Jesus speaking uh, to, uh, to his disciples in John 17, I, I do not pray that, that you should uh, take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. So we as Christians are called to be in the world, but not of the world. We're called to be um, not taken out of the world, but to be kept by God from the evil one. But when we're dealing with children who are more than likely unconverted, in an unconverted condition, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, that bad company corrupts good character. Now that's not a maybe, that's not a possibly, that's a promise. Bad company corrupts good character. And this idea of having... There's, in some ways, it's, I think it's okay that kids have friends. It's good to, for them to have friends. It's good for them to be mixed with peers. But this idea that, that they're constantly surrounded by a peer group and this, this kind of um, constant influence, I guess, if I, wanna, if I could put it like that, this inf the, the constant influence that they have in their life would be surrounded by unconverted peers is a dangerous situation. It's something for us to be mindful of, to be prayerful about, to be wise as to how we navigate some of those relationships that our children may have as we go through the calling of parenthood. And you may be in here today and think, well, I, I, haven't, got I haven't got children. Um, th this doesn't apply to us. But ultimately, one, well, you never know, maybe one day you may have. Uh, but there may, there's also, as I mentioned, there's young ones within the church for us to be encouraging in these things and to be uh, uh, speaking with and to be praying for and to be mindful and thinking about. So that's the first, I know that's a long point, but that's the first point really of the message this morning. 
the faithfulness of the bringers, that we would be, uh, uh, as we bring our children to the Lord, we would bring them faithfully, uh, teaching them in the word, bringing them in prayer, being mindful of the influences that could be around them in the, in the systems and the, the different uh, processes that we have to leave our, lead our children through as they grow into young adult life. Let's just look at the sinfulness of the rejectors. The sinfulness of the rejectors. <clears throat> Consider now the, the response of the disciples. We head back into our text today. These individuals brought these youngsters to Jesus. And how did the disciples respond? Well, it says that they, the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Rebuked them. Of all people, surely the disciples should have known better. They, they'd seen the, the teachings, the, the tender dealings that Christ had with the sick and with the needy. They'd seen how Christ had raised Jairus' daughter from the dead, healed the boy uh, uh, from, who had the deaf and dumb spirit and was caused to go into convulsions. They, they saw the tenderness of Christ and his willingness. But no, here they are, bold as brass, and they give a rebuke. They give a rebuke to those who had brought these little children, these little ones to him. Maybe, maybe they thought the Lord was too busy. These children were too insignificant, perhaps. Don't trouble the master now. Don't you realise Don't you realize this is the one here who walks on water? He walks on the ocean. Don't you realise he's, he's been healing paralytics? He's, he's been doing mighty miracles. He's raised the dead to life. He hasn't got time for these little ones. But, but oh, how wrong they were. How wrong they were. They, they were misunderstanding the purpose and the ministry of Christ, the heart of Christ uh, for the people. They weren't thinking right concerning the compassion and the, the godly concern that the Lord had for these precious souls which he was dealing with. <clears throat> the disciples weren't thinking straight at this point. They had a mean-spirited response, maybe a, maybe a coldness, a callousness, maybe even adopting a legalistic or a critical uh, view of these parents, these adults that brought these children uh, to this place. I wonder if they... I wonder if they maybe for a moment just thought back to their own calling. I wonder if they thought back to, you know, that time on the Sea of Galilee where the Lord came to them and said, follow me. If so, I wonder how they would have felt if someone had just interrupted at that point and said, no, sorry, not, not you. You know, you're, the master's too busy today. It's easy, isn't it, to, to grow proud in our, in our religion, in our religiosity. These disciples stepping in boldly, brashly, putting restrictions upon God's grace, so to speak, getting above themselves, showing a prideful and a critical attitude, taking the reins and overstepping the mark in relation to Christ's ministry. And may we as Christians be a church that would never put a stumbling block between people and Christ, between individuals and the Lord you can have legalistic churches. I've even heard people in legalistic churches talk about those being not, those aren't the sort of people we want here. That kind of attitude is terrible. Uh, we, we must be a church that welcomes people from all backgrounds to come in and to sit under the word and to be, and to be non, um, you know, we don't want to be like these disciples kind of putting people at arm's length um, as if somehow we deserve it any more than anyone else. Or people being shunned because they don't quite fit into our theological um, mould or, e or they don't quite uh, possess the same evangelical rhetoric or form that we have here in this group. They come in with a few rough edges and so they kind of get shunned to one side. And we can do those things subconsciously with people. You know, it's interesting that when we see in Scripture, God often saves and works in the hearts of those uh, who we, humanly speaking... We look around and, 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 and dare we say it, maybe sometimes we think, how can, how can you know, we, we, ha we have these prejudices when we look at people. I work with homeless guys. Sometimes I look at people and I'll be lying if there's not moments where I think, if God saves this person, well, what a, a, mir a miracle that would be. And the, the reality is every salvation is a miracle, including my own. And it's wrong to think like that. I mean, I'm, you know, confessing that as, as a sinful thing. It's, it's wrong to be... Um, 
to, to think that somehow God's grace doesn't extend to certain people because perhaps they've gone too far or they're not the sort of person that we think would fit in in this particular situation. <clears throat> He's the God who has the power and he often saves those who we least expect. These trophies of grace so that it's obvious that this work of salvation is of him and not of man. And let's just go back to the family dynamic a minute. We're thinking about ourselves as Christians here in the church, but even within the family. We've spoken about never giving up on bringing our children before the Lord. But we don't want to put our own religious stumbling blocks in the way of our children. We don't want to play the hypocrite, especially for those in ministry. This is very dangerous. You see pastor's children and they see dad being one thing, at home and saying another thing in, in a pulpit and we can as parents we can uh, we can play the hypocrite in front of our children they need to know within our homes our children need to know that that their parents are nothing less or more than sinners saved by grace we're not perfect people as parents there needs to be a culture of grace that's that permeates the home as I mentioned earlier, there's times where we need to perhaps apologise to one another and sit down and ask for forgiveness and pray with one another. A culture of grace that we would, that we would show to our children or the young ones around us that we're in need of the grace of God in Christ as much as they are. Homes that are filled with joy, not just religious uh, exercises where we, we go through a cold teaching in a drudgery uh, manner, in a, in a type of attitude, well, the, the, this devotion time now, we just need to get this done because we just need to do it. No, we should be, is there fun in your home? Is there laughter? Is there joy? Is there joy in your home? Is there those moments where you, you take your child and you swing them round and you, you know, you just, you show them that, that joy and that fun? Not just ramming down legalistic uh, laws and rules down their throats, most of which are probably just our own traditions anyway. If we do that, all you'll breed is a, a very pharisaical child, a child that grows up with a, yes, they may have head knowledge to a certain degree, but they'll be a, a, a little Pharisee, so to speak. But let's have homes that are cultured in, in the grace of God. Let's not put our own sin as a stumbling block in their way. God is willing to save these little ones. And we see the, the willing kindness of the Saviour, the willing kindness of of the Saviour. We see the kindness of his correction even towards his disciples in verse 14. When he saw what they were doing, they were pushing, they were pushing these little ones away. Jesus was greatly displeased, not just a bit, not just displeased, not just sad, he was greatly displeased and he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for such is the kingdom of God. Greatly displeased. We see his graciousness here in inviting the children to him, but before then, Jesus needs to deal with the sin. He, needs to, he, needs to, he brings a rebuke to the disciples. He rebukes them. He gives them instruction. Now, the instruction and the rebuke of Christ is a good thing. It's a good thing to be instructed by Christ, to be rebuked by him. We spoke the other day about suffering and how the Lord uses that to sanctify us, but, you know, sometimes... He has to correct us and he, correct, he correct, corrects us with his word. Proverbs 3, 11 to 12 says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction, for whom the Lord loves he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. You see, the Lord brings correction to his people. And he does that with us throughout our lives, doesn't he? We know the word of God is given uh, by inspiration of God, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And when we get saved, we, we see this. God, God really shows us in our conversion. He shows us that we are guilty before him. We, he shows us what he's done in his son Jesus. And when we're saved, we're often saved uh, and released from the power of these uh, overt sins that we've had. Uh, the glaringly obvious sins that would even be obvious to those loved ones around us, the drunkenness and, and the, 
the violence or whatever it is that you were saved from, um, the addictions, the outward uh, very overt sin that other people could even see in your own lives. But you know, when you get saved, that's really just the beginning of a work that God starts to do in us by His Spirit. And there's lots of things that the Lord will then work in our hearts by His Spirit to cleanse us of inward uh, pride and selfishness, things that more, more of the hidden sins that are taking place, controlling behaviours and covet covetousness and passions for possessions and so on and so forth. Then the Lord corrects us and he, and he rebukes us and he chips away. I gave that illustration of the, the ice sculptor sculpting the, the, the head of the horse and that's what God does to us as Christians. He chips away and he he takes, and by his power, he begins to help us to put to death the deeds of the flesh. But something to remember, as, um, as parents, and as Christians really, is that every day is a new day. We don't always get it right. We often get it wrong, we often sin, we often make the wrong choices. And yes, we need to be dealt with by God, God needs to... God shows us where we need to change, where we need to perhaps deal with that issue of anger, those outbursts of pride. God deals with us and shows us. But we need to realise that every day is a new day. Every day uh, has a, uh, there's fresh mercies for us as parents and as Christians uh, with whatever uh, journey that the Lord would have us on. We can come to the foot of the cross. We can take our, our mistakes. We can take our sin to the Lord. And we can just ask him to deal with us. He's faithful and just to cleanse us and to forgive us of our sins. <clears throat> so we see this one, this willing, this willing saviour who rebuked the disciples. But he came and he willingly uh, uh, welcomed these children. He's the one who willingly came from heaven. He humbled himself, walked amongst us as a man willingly mixed with the outcasts and those who were ostracized first century Jewish culture children would have been seen almost as second-class citizens along with with women as well often in various uh, Greco-Roman cultures but Jesus didn't see it that way he saw these these precious children there's a pr isn't it wonderful how there's a place for children in the Christian faith there's a place for children in the Christian faith there's very, unlike some other religions that kind of discriminate concerning who gets the biggest piece of the pie and all these different things, um, isn't it wonderful that we have a saviour that took these children in his arms and he welcomed them? The kindness of Christ that we see towards these, these weak and meek children. He was one who, who mixed with the weak, he mixed with the meek, so to speak. His willingness to come and to, to meet with the meek and lowly. These unassuming, vulnerable children. We see a picture here. These, that's one thing about kids, little, little, especially young kids. They, they haven't got anything to offer, have they? They, haven't, um, they can't contribute back in any way. They come empty-handed. They've got nothing to give. You know, if you, if, you, um, if you have a child in your family and... You're not going to be like charging your child to, to, to pay for the petrol to get to on holiday or, or letting them pay a share of the mortgage. You know, this little baby's got nothing to offer in, in that sense. Obviously, they have everything to offer in the sense of joy and who, and who they are as, as a member of the family. But with regards to just having that, <clears throat> that just kind of that vulnerability, that picture here of the vulnerable, the unassuming. Uh, those who have got nothing to offer. And we, we live in a world today, don't we, where just the opposite is often taught by people. Um, you know, we see people who, they, they'll only mix with certain individuals that are effectively going to scratch their back, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours type, type of attitude. Those who only will only kind of socialise with those who can be movers and shakers. Um, you know, you hear sayings like, show me your friends and I'll show you your future and all this kind of thing. And some of that some of that, in, in one sense, may be true. But you see, as Christians, we shouldn't just try and mix with people. We shouldn't just try and connect with people that are going to help us out or better our lives. That's, that's a very selfish way of living life. As Christians, we, we should mix with those who can't repay us. 
those who, 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 can't, who haven't got anything to, to give back to us, so to speak. Um, because that's a real servant heart, it's a real sense of loving someone when you know you're not going to get anything back from that person and yet you're still poured out for them. Shows great love. Romans 12, uh, the, the Apostle Paul writes, uh, to, he tells us to, to associate with the humble. To associate with the humble. Luke 14, we see this uh, picture here of taking the lowly place as Christians. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And then it says in um, <clears throat> verse uh, 12, 13 and 14, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor your rich neighbours, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, <clears throat> invite the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed. You will be blessed because they cannot pay you back. That's interesting, isn't it? You will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And that's really the Christian approach to dealing with vulnerable people, dealing with those who can't pay us back, those who are meek and lowly. We should be servants of these people. We should lay our lives down for these people, not to get something back from them, because they can't pay us back. But that there would be a payment of, of the, res, at the resurrection of the just, storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven and not here on earth. I'm conscious of time now, but just to, just to kind of come to a close, the last point, a childlike faith to be received, a childlike faith to be received. We spoke last week, didn't we, of the man who was uh, close to the kingdom. Remember the commandments? He, he said, yeah, you're right, teacher, the greatest commandment. And Jesus said, you're not far from the kingdom. Well, here the Lord, again, is speaking of the kingdom of God. Um, <clears throat> let, not the, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. And then it says in verse 15, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive... Uh, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. This idea of the kingdom of God is, is synonymous in scripture sometimes with the kingdom of heaven. Um, Jesus first he says, for such is the kingdom of God. For such is the kingdom of God. Now there, there are different views as to what this could mean with regards to these children. For such is the kingdom of God. That for, some, um, <clears throat> for some this means that these youngsters, uh, babies, infants, maybe in, gen in a general sense, those who are conceived, uh, would belong to the kingdom until a point of innocence, um, until, a, until a, 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 some form of intentional sin had been committed, so to speak. So if a child, for example, died in the womb, there are some Christians that would say that child would belong to God's kingdom, that child would be welcomed into heaven. If they died in that condition, for example, John MacArthur is one who takes that approach. I'm not necessarily saying I agree or disagree with that, but this idea of these uh, children before, you have, you have issues with that concerning age of innocence and what that would look like and where that's even found in scripture and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, even adults with mental incapacities, are they welcome to the kingdom? What does that look like? So that would be one approach. There are others who also hold to um, believing in the um, doctrine of election, uh, which is, a, we, I believe is a biblical doctrine, for sure, as revealed in Scripture, holding to the notion that the kingdom of God is reserved ultimately for the elect and hell for the non-elect. Um, so, for example, this is a hypothetical example, but if, say, say Esau... Uh, Romans 9 says to uh, J Jacob I loved and Esau I have hated. We see a picture of the elect and the non-elect before they'd done anything right and wrong. Um, so if Esau would have died in infancy, would that therefore mean he's not uh, a child of the kingdom? And so on and so forth. Um, is, is, elect is, election, is, is the election of God even a reality for youngsters, for unborn children? Again, that's just another view. I'm not saying I agree, disagree with that. There are some such as our Presbyterian brothers and sisters, who would take these verses and verses like these and try to suggest some form of covenant uh, solidarity, so to speak, um, making mention that, that the, this means that these, young, these little ones are clearly here being described as belonging to the covenant people of God and therefore to, them is su to, to those such as this belongs the kingdom of heaven. 
Um, again, I'm not subscribing necessarily to that either. I would probably lean more towards the first point where MacArthur sits uh, personally, and I'm happy to talk about more about that going forward. The reality is the Bible's very, fairly um, inconclusive with regards to these particular issues. It's fairly silent, and you want to tread very... Whenever the Bible's fairly silent, you want to tread carefully with these particular um, topics concerning do, if ch children die in infancy, would they go to heaven, would they be uh, straight into the kingdom of God, so to speak? How does that look? Um, we have examples in scripture of, say, for example, David, where his child died, and then he went and he fasted and he wept, and then uh, it, it, before his child died, he fasted and wept, and his child actually died, and he got up and he anointed himself and he, and he ate. Um, and uh, he said in Second uh, Samuel, uh, chapter 12, uh, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows whether the Lord would be gracious to me, that the child may live, but now he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? Uh, and then he says, I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. So David there talking about going to be with his son at some point. Again, things like that, you have to just tread very carefully with those particular uh, topics. But what we do know... And I, I, don't, I hope that hasn't confused anyone, and I'm happy to talk about that after. What we do know is that, firstly, God is just. God is a just God, and he will do what is right. If a child dies in infancy, ladies who, who have miscarried and so on and so forth, and we think about the millions and millions of abortions that are going on uh, in our day and age, um, we know that God will do what is just. Um, and we also know that if there's any young child that does die and, 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 and finds himself in heaven, they will be there because of the shed blood of Christ. Because every, the, the only way anyone will be in heaven is because of the shed blood of Christ. We can argue points about capacity to have faith and believe and things like that, but the only way any human will be found in heaven is because of the sacrifice of Christ. We know that we all, every human from conception, is, is conceived with a, with a sin nature. We're under Adam. Uh, Psalm 51 tells us, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin my mother conceived me. And that sin nature needs to be dealt with. And it can only be dealt with by the cross of Jesus Christ. Very finally, now I'm conscious I've gone on a lot, but very, very finally, Jesus said, <clears throat> and really this is the context here, uh, of the whole, really, the whole passage, this idea of uh, the kingdom of God belonging to such as these. He then goes on and says, I, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will, will by no means enter it. To receive the kingdom of God as a little child. Jesus isn't here, he's not talking here about being childish or immature. He's not just talking about being mindless. You know, sometimes children... You, you just wonder, in, if I could put it for want of a better phrase, you just wonder where their head's at with certain decisions they make, why they do certain things. You just think, what, was, what did they do that for? You know, this isn't what Jesus is talking about. The Bible talk calls us to be sober, to be vigilant, to be watchful, self-controlled, sober-minded. Christianity, as I was speaking the other week, it's a, it, it is an intellectually robust religion, an, intell an intellectually robust worldview. We're called to have our minds renewed in truth. We're called to be, to be heavenly minded. Now that doesn't mean to walk around with your head in the clouds all day. It means to basically have your head set upon the things of God, to be seeking the Lord's will uh, for our lives. Ephesians 4 uh, verses 13 and 15, the Apostle Paul writes to, um, until we attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to mature manhood. We're, we're called to be mature and to grow in maturity to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So part of the growing up of the Christian is to be rooted in the, the truth and sound doctrine. Finally, and I know I've said finally two times now, but the faith that is needed a childlike faith, a humility, a dependent trust upon Christ. We see children and they're living in the moment, they're living in the day. They're living for, they're living for, for, for this point of time, 
a very simple faith that they have concerning getting through their day. We, we, our first reading at the start of today about not being anxious. And we're called to have this simple faith, like this, the, th the thief on the cross. There's two thieves and the one thief. He has a simple faith in Christ. He knows that he's a great sinner and that he has a great saviour. He he's not, perhaps not a theological expert. He perhaps hasn't had an upbringing where he's learnt all the memory verses, but he's found himself in the kingdom of God because he's trusted this one, this king and this saviour. And this is really, really the essence, what it means to receive uh, Christ in a, in a, a, in a, and have that childlike faith in Christ. Is it good to have good doctrine? Yes, it's through the, the, the true and accurate doctrine that we come to know God and we grow in our walk with him. But we must remember that we're not saved by a doctrine. We're not saved by a doctrine, even a good doctrine. We're not saved by the doctrine of justification by faith alone. We're saved by a person. We're saved by Jesus, the man. And he calls us to come to him, to come to him as little children, to trust him for who he is and for what he's done for us at the cross. I'm conscious there was a lot in there today, but just some things for us to think about. For those of us in here who are parents, it's Mother's Day. Uh, but those of us who aren't parents, uh, there's a lot for us just to be considering about how we interact with children, uh, the children here of the church, how we can bring our loved ones before the Lord in prayer, uh, and what that means to us in our, in our own lives with regards to the word and seeking the Lord. Let's pray together, shall we? <clears throat> Father, we, we do thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your goodness to us, Lord. Thank you for the gift of uh, parenthood and childhood, and thank you, Lord, that there's little ones amongst us even today. Lord, we do pray that you would help us to grow in that calling, Lord, help us to be faithful in that area, that we would be a church that uh, welcomes families. We would be a family integrated church, Lord, so to speak, and these little ones amongst us would just be lifted to you in prayer and, and, uh, and, and taught in the word, Lord. And Father, we just pray that you would be pleased to save amongst us open hearts and minds, we ask. Be with us now as we go from here. Guard our hearts, Lord, lead us and guide us as we continue our week and we keep our eyes on you. Be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>